It's great to be in the house of the Lord together this morning. Amen. Amen. We're here to praise the Lord this morning. We stand together. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Let's Amen. praise the Lord. Let's praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. And I'll praise.
find ourselves in places and in seasons where it's difficult to surrender to the Father's will. And we have to understand and realize that we need Him more than we can even imagine. And that He is the one that is in control. He is the one that we need.
That is our prayer this morning. That God, we need you. You may be seated. Amen. At this time, we want to just continue in a spirit of prayer and praying for our lives and our connection with the Lord. And I'd ask that you just join me in prayer and bow our heads together. Father, we've just sung to you that we need you. And that's truth. We need you every day, every hour, every minute. And we bring ourselves to you, Lord. We bring our needs to you. And Lord, we also just sang that, uh, Lord, we want your will. And Lord, um, that can be a challenge, Father. Because Lord, when we have a need, oftentimes connected to that is, is a, a decision. And that is, will we, will we give this to you? Will we allow you and your will to make our decision for us? Or Lord, will we struggle with what we want? Lord, the greatest prayer that we can pray is, Lord, I want what you want. And Lord, I, I pray that right now, Father, um, all of us would, would look internally and say, is there a decision that we're trying to work through in our lives that weighs heavily on our hearts right now? And we just want to lay that before you, whatever that might be. And Lord, we pray for the rest of this service. May it bring you honor and glory. And may you be blessed by what you see and what you hear. And Lord, um, may it all be done to your honor and to your glory. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward so we might present to the Lord his tithes and, and offering. Let's pray. Father, it's a blessing to give. And Lord, we embrace that opportunity right now. And pray, Father, that you would use whatever is given to bless your kingdom, to bless your people and your kingdom, to impact your kingdom in a powerful way. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's good to have you again with us this morning, and I pray that you uh, sense the love of God in this place and His people. And it's great to have you. We we have a, a couple who came actually that I knew from Illinois. So we've come from some have come from a great distance away. So Tony and Carla, we welcome you this morning as well, and uh, we're we're glad that that you have a, that you're with us this morning. I'm going to ask that uh, if you would that you would turn with me to a scripture passage in Matthew chapter 26 in verses I'm going to be reading verses 36 or actually 36 through 45 and then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them 
and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now I have a little bit of a technical problem here, and that is my computer is not working and my message is on it. So, Darren, would you come up real quick? You know, I've always prayed and said, Lord, oh, wait a minute, here it comes. I think it might be. It was sleeping. Oh. And now I hope it's coming back. Is it going to make it there? I think so. We got a cursor. Here we go. Yeah. Thank you. Right on. Praise the Lord. Do you, you know what kind of panic that is? Thank you. It must have been Darren's presence. But, um, do you know what kind of panic that is to be sitting here reading scripture and you're like, okay, Lord, this needs to come up in a very short period of time or I'm in serious trouble. I did not memorize this message. So let's start. I want to begin with an anonymous quote. And actually, before I begin with that, I'm, all, I'm stuck in computer mode here. If you, weren't, if you haven't been with us, last week I, I started a message series on wisdom. And I thought it's really important because I think in many ways, wisdom is misunderstood. We tend to think of it as just intellect. But what we discovered last week is that wisdom is, is the heart and the mind working in tandem together with God. And they both need to be, both need to be in, uh, as I said, in tandem, working together. And so today, what we're going to be talking about is decision making. And I want to begin with this quote. I believe we have it up there. It's, and it says this today. And this is from an anonymous person, by the way. I don't know who said this, but I think it's very, um, very good. Today I am what I am because of my yesterday's choices, and where I shall be tomorrow will be decided today. Repeat after me. I am what I am because of my choices. Now, if you turn to your neighbor and say, you're the result of your choices. Just do it really quickly. You're the result of your choices. And if you're brave, if you're brave, you might add, I suggest choice therapy for you. Now, seriously, with so much riding on our choices, if there's an area where we desperately need God's wisdom, it's making wise choices. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's an area where we, we just, we need that. So what's been your plan? What's been your method, your strategy for making wise, godly choices? I wonder if, if there's any of you who still cling to the uh, decision-making processes or plans and strategies, methods of your youth. Like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a rabbit by the toe, if he hollers, let him go, out goes Y-O-U. Are there any rock, paper, scissors people out there that used to do that? You know, I, I never learned how to do that, but I know a lot of people did. And if you still making relational decisions with the proverbial flower, he loves me, he loves me not. You know, that's, a, that's the prehistoric days of decision making. And wouldn't, you might say, well, wouldn't life be great if we, were, we could return back to those days? I mean, think of the divorcing couple navigating through the excruciating decision of who gets what. And they say, okay, rock, paper, scissors for the house, for the car, for the furniture. Wouldn't work that well, would it? How about the graduating senior trying to narrow down his list of potential college choices by eeny meeny, mighty mo, or the single career woman deciding whether or not to commit herself to a long-term relationship and taking out that flower and saying, he loves me, he loves me not. And I think most of us would agree that our childhood methods of decision making just don't cut it anymore, right? It just don't, and the reason being is our decisions are so complicated and complex today. Is my marriage salvageable? Can I really re afford to retire right now? Should I go the chemotherapy route or forsake it for quality of life? Can I trust anyone with a secret that I bear alone? Is this what I want to do for the rest of my life or do I need a career change? And as I say, ask my prayer, is there a decision which weighs heavily on your heart today? Now I have good news for you. 
If that's the case, I can assure you of this, that whatever decision you face, Jesus understands what you're feeling and facing. And some of you, you wouldn't say this out loud, but you might be thinking, did you pastors all learn the same lines in pastor school? Because we all say, Jesus understands what I'm feeling and facing. And you might say, really? Really? Because Jesus never married. So he hasn't a clue what it's like to be married to the, the spouse from hell as I am. <laughs> Jesus never experienced that. Where every day is a decision to stay or bail. Jesus never had cancer or an adult child who refused to grow up. Jesus never worried about his retirement portfolio or his long-term care insurance because he, he by, bypassed old age by ascending right into heaven at the age of 33. So don't tell me he understands what I'm facing and feeling. And you know what? You're right. Maybe Jesus never encountered the same decisions that you face, but he did face a decision which is beyond our realm of understanding. Can you imagine living for 30 plus years with the choice of dying for the sins of the world in the forefront of your mind? And knowing that your death would be via crucifixion, the cruelest, bloodiest, torturous death ever devised in human history. And if you're Jesus, it's your first thought when your feet hit the floor in the morning and your last thought before you drift off to sleep at night. So you're going to tell me that in his humanness, he couldn't possibly understand the complexity of your decisions or know the angst and the fear and the uncertainty that you feel. He does. So this morning, what I'd like to do is walk us through the most momentous decision in all human history to discover Jesus' decision-making method. And what better decision-making model than Jesus himself? Now the good news is this, is that you don't need to be deity to implement Jesus' model, his method in your life. So let me take you to the point of the, Jesus' decision in the Garden of Gethsemane, where the weight of his decision has hit him full force. Let's go back to Matthew 26. We'll be looking at two verses, verses 38 and 39. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. The fate of the world hangs on Jesus' decision and what his is decision-making plan. Well, I think I see two priorities of Jesus in that scripture that I read for you. Here's the two. He said, I need my A team, and I need to pray. Now, first, Jesus took his A team. He said, What do you mean by his A team? He took Peter, James, John, his inner circle, his most trusted friends. He took them to be with him. But what? It wasn't like Jesus asked for their input. I mean, what are your thoughts, guys, on this crucifixion decision? I mean, am I doing the right thing? It, that didn't happen. What did Jesus, why did he need him? He said, I need you to keep watch with me. I need your presence. I need your support. I need your prayers. The reason being, I can't do this alone. Now, I don't want you to miss this, that the Savior of the world refused to decide in isolation. Now, what does this say to people like, like ourselves, whose A team might be me, myself, and I? It tells me that God has a better way. And I want you to listen to God's rationale in his word. Proverbs 13, 10. Wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 15, 22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Now, Jesus, he didn't need input, but you and I do. I need the collective wisdom of godly people who know me, who love me, who support me. And you know why? There's a reason why. It's, and we find it right in scripture, scripture. Proverbs 12, 15. Look at this verse. The way of a fool seems right to them, 
but the wise listen to advice. You know what the scripture tells me is that you and I can have blind spots, wisdom blind spots. What do I mean by that? We can fall in love with our own insights, our own opinions, our own ideas, to the point where we're unable and unwilling to ever listen to anyone else's wisdom. God could be using you to speak his wisdom to me, but I can't hear it because I'm so enamored with my own wisdom. In fact, I'd even go so far to say is that some of you might even have people in your life that you avoid because they typically offer you their wisdom that you don't want to hear. In the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, the story is told of two kings, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and Ahab, king of Israel. And the story goes that these two kings joined together to fight a mutual enemy in battle. But before the battle even commences, Jehoshaphat says to Ahab, you know, before we, before we fight, before we march out to meet this enemy, we need to seek God's counsel first. And then he asks Ahab, is there a prophet of the Lord who can seek God's direction for us? And Ahab says, yes. There's this one prophet, but I hate him. Because he never prophesies anything good about me. It's always bad. But they bring in God's prophet, Micaiah, and he prophesies that Ahab will be killed in battle. And Ahab's response is, didn't I tell you? He only prophesies bad about me. So does Ahab say, well, you know what? Based upon this wisdom, I'm sitting this battle out. No. That would be the wise decision to make. Instead, Ahab disguises himself, rides in the battle, and gets killed by a stray arrow. How sad that God repeatedly warns Ahab through the counsel of his prophets, like they're warning him, danger, danger, like the robot in the old TV show Lost in Space. Do you remember him? Danger, danger, danger. And yet Ahab ignores the prophets, decides for himself, which eventually costs him his life. You know, frequently, being in the profession that I'm in, people will come to me for spiritual guidance and wisdom, and I appreciate that. But let me tell you the different type of people that come. Sometimes, I'm their last resort. It's like, I've exhausted every option, so I might as well try the pastor. Sometimes, People come to me to validate their decision they've already made, almost like I'm a spiritual notary. <laughs> come to me and say, Pastor, I know you don't agree with our decision to live together, but we love each other and we don't need a paper license to signify our love and recognize that God brought us together. I guess they're waiting for me to say, okay, you're good in God's eyes. Stamp. But sometimes people will say, Pastor, I have this decision to make, and I don't want to make it alone. I need your support. I need your presence. I need your prayer. I need your accountability. I need God's wisdom to choose in a godly way. So let me ask all of us in this room, who's your a -team? Who's your inner circle? Your trusted friends, the people who love you and will speak God's truth to you regardless of what that is. Can you name them? And if you don't have an A-team, who might God surface for you? You know, just a short time ago, I had someone approach me and I was really blessed by this, this conversation. This person came to me and said, you know, Kenny, I was thinking about you as a pastor in that, you know, you're, you're always listening to people, but who do you have to talk to? And I was thinking, do you really have somebody that you can really just be true to yourself and actually tell them what's really going on in your life? And then this person said to me, if you ever need anyone to talk to, I'm here. That really blessed me. And it also showed me that, and I believe this, that if we pray, Lord, I need an A-team. Will you surface these people for me? Who are the people that I can really rely on 
when it comes to wisdom for my decisions. So first, Jesus didn't make his decision in isolation. He needed his A-team. And secondly, he prayed. That's not exactly a jaw-dropping statement, right? Because Jesus prayed about everything. So of course, he would pray about the monumental decision to die for our sins, just like we pray over big decisions in our lives. Hold on. <laughs> That's not quite true. Ten years ago, the Pew Research Center, which is not even a Christian organization, although they had the word Pew in it, it's a secular organization. They conducted an extensive survey and discovered these stats. Here's the, I think we have them, Kevin, right? Yeah. First of all, look at this. 45% of Americans rely on prayer in making important life decisions. So that means that what, 55 do not. Is that surprising? No, but maybe this next one is. 55% of Christians rely on prayer when making important life decisions. 55. You know what that means? Almost half of Christians aren't praying over major life decisions like marriage, divorce, career choices, moves, which church to attend. And this last one, 82% of all people rely the heaviest on personal research in making important life decisions. That means that 82% basically choose Google over prayer. I think we have a little bit of a problem there, don't we? But let's say that you and I, just for the sake of conversation, that we're part of the 55% who see prayer as a non-negotiable prior, uh, priority for our decision making, how then do we pray? How do we pray? I think of the young girl who was asked to pray at the dinner table in front of uh, a number of invited guests. And she said, Mom, I don't know what to say. And her mother encouraged her, well, just say what you hear Mommy said. And the girl bowed her head and prayed, Dear Lord, why on earth did I invite all these people to dinner? <laughs> you know, as children of God, we need a good model, right, for our decision-making prayer. And again, it's Jesus. And I want you to listen closely to Jesus' Gethsemane prayer. Look at verse 39. You start out, there's only two sentences that we have recorded in Scripture. Here's the first sentence. First sentence is, My Father, if it is possible... May this cup be taken from me. Just leave that up, Kevin, by the way. Let me say it again. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. What is Jesus praying here? Father, I am not feeling this crucifixion thing. Is there a way that I can bypass the cross because it's not what I want? And it isn't making my disciples any happier either. And what makes it even harder is knowing I have 10,000 legions of angels at my beck and call, and I can call them and end this right now. <laughs> Do you hear what Jesus is praying here? He's praying his desire, his will, his preference. But then Jesus prays. Do you see this one little word there that changes it all? Yet. Yet. Not as I will, but as you will. In other words, Father, I want what you want. It's my most important priority in making this decision. It's not only my priority, it's my conviction. And you might read this and say, this is like prayer whiplash. First, it's, this is my preference, and then over here, it's my conviction. It's, it's, why would Jesus pray this way? And this is so important. I feel like the Lord really laid this on my heart this week, looking at this passage. Jesus understood the power of our desires, the power of our wills, the power of our preferences, our likes, our dislikes, which are often in conflict. That's not even a good enough word. Often in combat with God's desires, God's will, and our godly convictions. And what Jesus is doing here in prayer is neutralizing the power of his desire and preference by acknowledging it and offering it to God. God, this is what I want. 
This is my desire. But then he contrasts that to God's desire, God's will, and his primary conviction, which is, God, I want what you want. And you might ask, well, why is that so important that I, I, in prayer that I would say what I want and then remind myself of what God wants? Lloyd Ogilvy said this at one point, and this is, this is the answer. Even though we pray about our challenges and problems, all too often what we really want is strength to accomplish what we've already decided is best for ourselves and others. Meanwhile, we press on with our own priorities and plans. We, we remain the scriptwriter, casting director, choreographer, and producer of the drama of our own lives in which we are the star performer. How easy is it for us to become the star performer in our own decision making? Well, it's all about our desires, our wills, our preferences, apart from God's will. In fact, you might even pray prayers that sound like this. I'm going to pray two prayers, and I want you to see if you can see the difference. Here's the first one. Lord, Father, thank you for this job offer, which promises more pay and advancement. Lord, I'd be a fool not to take it. So I pray that you provide me with the confidence and the ability to be successful at this job. Now contrast this to Jesus' prayer model. Father, I want this job, which has been offered to me. You know how long I have prayed and sought for a job like this that fits my financial needs and my skill set. Yet, Lord, I also realize this, that you have a perspective that I need. And what's most important to me, Lord, is that I'm obedient to your will. I want what you want. Do you see the difference? Jesus' rule of thumb for all of his decision-making was God's will. I want what you want. And you say, great. But I know what you're thinking. What if I'm unsure about God's will? Any of you had a, a burning bush experience in your life? Vision, dreams, audible voices? Even if you have, how often do they happen? So what does God's will look like for, for me, who's not exactly a spiritual giant? Here's our answer in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then you'll be able to uh, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. According to God's word, discerning God's will requires choosing to su surrender two aspects of our lives. First, we surrender our bodies. The message translation says it this way. Take you, your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. So first, it's our, it's our bodies. And secondly, to surrender our minds, our wills. It's not what I will, but what you will, Lord. Now, I want you to think of, I might have used this illustration in the past, I don't, I don't remember if I have, but it, it's like ballroom dancing. Any ballroom dancers here? Anybody been trained? I see, I see a few hands kind of like sheepishly put up like this. Uh, I've taken a ballroom dance lessons uh, just enough to be dangerous. And I can tell you this, that ballroom dancing requires one lead. That's the one thing I learned about ballroom dancing. Um, let me tell you a little story. When I was a, uh, a youth pastor in Massachusetts, we had this we had this brainchild of putting on a prom for seniors, and I don't mean seniors in high school. We put on a prom for senior citizens. We invited four nursing homes in the area to come to the high school, and we had an orchestra that, that, that played, and we actually did a prom. Everybody dressed up, and uh, there were no tuxes, but but dresses and. 
in suits, and they, they, they all came, and we did the pictures, and we did the, we did the ballroom dancing. Now, what we didn't figure on, and probably on me as a youth pastor, is that the ratio of men to women that were there, there was probably like 75 women and 10 men that came. You say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, it, there's a problem when it comes to dancing. Because you had 10 men, and probably six or seven of them were incapacitated to dance. So what we did was, as, as volunteers, we learned, a few, took a few classes, and, and we were taught briefly in how to ballroom dance. You said, oh, great. Well, there were maybe three or four of us that were able to dance with the 75 women, and, and they were literally fighting over us. First time I've ever had women fight over me in my entire life. <laughs> Literally fighting to dance, dance with me, and so you, you. And I mean, really, you just walk over by the table, and they'd all be jumping, and it, it was just crazy. And so, the first person. Uh, so again, there's only three or four of us that were dancing, and and the first person that I danced with. I remember I've only taken one or two classes in ballroom dancing, and they're playing a waltz. I thought I had the basic steps down, the box steps, and so on. And I got out there and I, and I started, I think I stepped on her feet a few times and finally she looked at me and she said, would you, would you mind, she real sheepishly asked this, would you mind if I lead? <laughs> I said, yes. And for the rest of the night, they all led and I danced, had them lead. Two people can't lead or it will be a train wreck. So the first requirement of ballroom dancing is surrendering to the direction of the lead. It's not about dancing from your gut, watching the other dancers, or trying to retrace your past steps. It's moving in rhythm with the lead. And the lead gives gentle cues, a nudge to the back, pressing lightly on the arm in a specific direction, so ballroom dancing at its best produces two people becoming one. And to dance like that requires a surrender of the body and the mind, the wills, as well as attentiveness to the lead. And from the lead, it takes gentle guidance and skill. So let's apply this spiritually. Our relationship with God is a spiritual dance. So let me ask you, who's leading? Have you surrendered your body and your mind and your will to his leading? If you have, then God will lead you. In Psalm 32, 8, we have this promise. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And God will lead you by giving you cues, gentle nudges through his spirit. Wisdom from his word. Godly wisdom and counsel from other Christians. A peace of heart, etc., etc. And his leading will provide the direction you need to make wise, godly choices. I close with this. Charles Swindoll, the retired pastor and author, once said, no married couple suddenly divorces. No home suddenly fractures. No church suddenly splits. Nobody becomes a cynic overnight. Nobody makes one leap from the pinnacle of praise to the sound of carnality. Erosion is a slow, silent process based upon secret choices. Friends, there's a lot riding on our decisions, and today we bring them into the light the light of God's spirit. And again, I ask you, is there a decision that's weighing heavily upon you today? And if there is, do you have an A-10? And are you able to pray as Jesus prayed, I want what you want? And have you surrendered your body, your mind, and your will? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you've given us the freedom and the capability to make decisions. Lord, you do not force us to decide. And, Lord, we do not want to decide on our own. Apart from you. 
And Lord, I think if we went around the room, all of us could share times where, Lord, we made decisions on our own and it didn't go well, apart from you. And so Lord, today I pray that we've come to understand it maybe even in a little better way, the wisdom of making godly choices, that we have an A team, we have people that we trust, who are support, supporters, who, who are able to offer us wisdom of, of the Lord. Father, we have an A-team. And Lord, are we able to pray where we're honest with you about our desires and then, Lord, contrasting that with our top conviction that is, Lord, wanting what you want. And Father, are we able to surrender our bodies and our wills? And Lord, if we're able to do that, we have this promise in Psalm 32 that you will teach us and instruct us in the way we should go. You will enable us and empower us to choose wisely. And Lord, I pray that for everyone in this room, whatever decision weighs upon their heart today, and I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
ask my brother, uh, Jimmy Norris, our head deacon, if he would close us in prayer today. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. As we face the challenges of this world, let us always rely on you because you are the leader. Mm -hmm. Dear Father, you always said you will never forsake us and you will walk with us through the shadows and the valleys. Mm -hmm. Dear Father, we rely on you to guide and protect all of us now as we return to our next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.